Fernando, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask you this idea about telling this story visually and the idea of walls and where they came into the story and why they were important to you, both cinematically and in terms of the whole idea of walls and bridges, building bridges through walls and reconciliation. Yeah, Actually, the, the idea of using walls is an interpretation of the script <laughs> because, uh, I mean, in, in that speech that... Uh, Pope Francis uh, talks about the, the, the economic system that is very unfair. Uh, I, th I think he was also talking about the walls. Pope Francis has a line that I included in the film, which is uh, build bridges, not walls. And actually, that's what he does. I mean, he's, he's talking to all the religions. He sees the world as just one, one thing. I mean, we're, we're, we're all interdependent, one to the other. And he sees like this. And he's only one of the few voices that understands, I mean, how we depend on each other. And, and, uh, and so he's the guy that builds bridges. And I thought I wanted to include this line. So I, I used the wall so I could use this, his line in the end. Anthony, this I believe began as a play and then became a screenplay, is that right? That's correct, yeah. So how did it develop first as a play and what turned it into a movie script? Uh, I was in Rome. I happened to uh, be in St. Peter's Square as a tourist and uh, Pope Francis was, uh, by happenstance, giving an open-air mass and... Um, uh, he was up there on the super screen with, I guess, about 5,000 tourists. And I just became interested in the charisma of this man. But I also knew that there was a second pope and he had resigned and he was sequestered in a convent about 100 yards behind. And the question started to arise, why would this first pope, Pope Benedict, have resigned, the first to do so in 700 years um, and I thought there must be a story there. So I, I, uh, it started with a Google search and then went back to London and um, the idea of, the, of a dialogue, of, of a real disputation between, um, you know, a, a conservative and a liberal started to take root in, in my mind. And um, I had a, a lovely experience in, in New York. A, a gentleman came up to me after the screening and said, you do realize this is a Jewish uh, movie, don't you? <laughs> and I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, wh why do you say that? And he said, because it's a foundation aspect of, of Judaism to dispute scripture, that, that dogma is not to be revered, it's to be assailed and questioned. Um, and you are basically got two rabbis going at it right, here. Right. And he said, it's completely Talmudic, and, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's the most Jewish film I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so when... When you're writing a movie about somebody like Stephen Hawking or Winston Churchill or Freddie Mercury, we know a little bit about what they've done and what they've said they've done because they have friends and family and wives who've written stories about them. Popes aren't quite as public. They have sermons. They have things that they say yeah. in the pulpit, but they don't really talk about their inner lives. So how do you start piecing together what it is they're feeling and believing and extrapolating back from what it is that they're preaching? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, th th I mean, there's vast public records of their public statements. The problem is most of them are in, uh, in Latin. Um, <laughs> my Latin is a little rusty. That, so that took a Quid bit pro quo, do you know that one? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's this for that, yeah, and uh, we're right. all learning. <laughs> um, but no, it's uh, the the first uh, challenge when you're doing anything based on historical record is 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 research because it's you're in effect painting a portrait, and you have to do a good rendering as much as truthfully as possible um, to make it lifelike. So that begins with research. So an enormous amount of reading and talking and and people who knew them. Um, I met some people in Germany who knew Benedict, and uh, and um, you know there's YouTube and Internet avails and all that stuff. So a lot of research to get it right. And let me jump here. Yeah. Uh, even the Commissar Rex is real, and the Fanta is real. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it feels like a joke, but it's not a joke. No, the most it's research. That's yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah. yeah, no, the most eccentric aspects of this are, are absolutely true. Don't the Fanta. The Fanta. There's a little side story. The Fanta is um, um, is because during World War. Two, if you were in G Nazi Germany, they banned Coca-Cola, but they allowed Fanta. So children at, at that time <laughs> became addicted to this this orange drink. And he still drinks it and doesn't touch a drop of wine to this day. Yeah, Not even sacramental wine. Good point. We don't know. Mm. That's for the sequel. Um, 
<laughs> the wine years. Tracy, I want to ask you about your work with Fernando. You'd worked on Constant Gardener. And at the time this project came around, I think you were doing something radically different. Is that right? Well, the strange thing is M Mark and I were both involved in the London Olympic opening ceremony. I produced it. Mark designed it. And on one occasion, Fernando was coming to supper at our house in London. We were like, you should do Rio. He was like, no way, no way. Cut to Fernando directed the opening of the Rio <laughs> Olympics. Um, so our past, we worked together on The Constant Gardener. And when Fernando f was sent the script uh, by Jonathan and Dan for um, The Pope, as it was then called, um, it was an amazing opportunity for us to, uh, yeah, get back together and get the old team together as well. A lot of the team from the Constant Gardener, Cesar Chalone, mm -hmm. Mark Stuart Your Wilson. Your cinematographer. Yes, uh, Stuart Wilson, uh, multi-Oscar nominated sound recordist. Um, yeah, many of the team, we got back together. Mark, I'll avoid the joke, Rome wasn't built in a day, but how, m how long did it take you to actually recreate the Sistine Chapel? And when you're thinking about its design, there are a lot of people, I was there a year and a half ago, who know pretty much what it looks like, but you also have to create it so that Fernando and the actors can work in it. So what are the design challenges and how do you do balance that against the practicalities of what they need for, sh for filming? Okay, so and by the way, it's an amazing Sistine Chapel. I think we would all agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so, um, so the process uh, started. Obviously, the the script came, and we we had this whole sequence in there. It was central to the story. There was no avoiding it. So um, we sat down and talked to some fine scenic artists and worked out a program that was going to take 17 weeks, which would mean the film would be finished by that time. So we then had to think again. So we looked at some versions where we thought about printing it. And we tried that, and it was very flat. And then, um, and then one of the guys um, knew of a company in Italy who had just done a new process, and they're called <coughs> Tattoo Wall. And so basically what they do is they take a digital image, they print it onto a sheet of film, like a children's tattoo, and you, when, you know, when you put it on your skin and then you peel it back. So basically it gets all, all of the color and the ink, and then as a construction team we build a, a plaster wall, and then they paper it with these tattoos. So we tried this out as a technique and it was fantastic. So that took four weeks to paper, hmm. a week to print, four weeks to paper, and we took seven weeks to build all the rest of the structure, which was obviously the, the floor and the and the um, the rude screen and the high altar and all those pieces. <coughs> so it's got, a, it's got a pretty paintings? good ceiling. Um, how do you do the ceiling and no, get lights in actually, there? The, the thing was, actually, we just managed to get a studio in Cinecitta, which is the big studio in Rome, but it was only just big enough to take the floor plan, just, uh, and it wasn't tall enough to take the ceiling. So um, we, we, made a <laughs> we, made it, we made it as high as we possibly could in the time, and the rest was CG for the ceiling. Wow. But I, I will tell you a story that, obviously, Fernando and Cesar, the cameraman, were super keen. When we, when we went around the Sistine Chapel, it's obviously it's been um, cleaned and refurbished, and it's super beautiful. The the colours are super bright, and um, when we got the material, the digital material that was on offer, it was from the pre-cleaned Sistine, so it was full of candle smoke, and it was almost dark and brown, and that's not what we wanted. So in the end, what we did was we managed to gather some scenic artists, and we painted a lot of the stuff of the Sistine Chapel. We painted it at one third scale, so a third of the actual size. Uh, by hand, we painted it in the right colors, then we photographed that, and then we put that up. So Very it was sort of p p partly, <laughs> partly photographic, partly scenic in the end. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you about the first day you were able to step into that set. Uh, I hope it was mostly completed uh, by the time you were able to visit the Sistine Chapel and what that meant as an actor to walk into that space. Uh, well, it kind of meant no acting required. <laughs> It was uh, an extraordinary space, and um, at first I, I've never uh, been um, patient enough to queue to get into the real Sistine Chapel. So this was a this was a great opportunity for me to see it. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. There, there are tours if you like sign up early, you can go ahead of time. But uh, nah, I don't need to know. Okay, no. I'm going to ask you about it's a kind of an iteration of the question I asked Anthony about getting to the interior life of the Pope because. When you're building that character, do you start by looking at how he appears on video? There's lots of YouTube videos. You read his 
writings? How do you start to inhabit the mind? The physical part we'll ask about later, but the mind of the Pope. Um, well, uh, obviously you start with the script and uh, all the, a lot of the information about what he thinks and feels ab about things, about religion and the church and politics is, is all there in the script. So what you need to do in some ways is to em embody him physically. And uh, for me, I was, you know, it wasn't that much of a stretch because the day he was created Pope, the internet was full of images of him and me, and uh, some of me as me, and some as me as the High Sparrow, and uh, the, the, everyone was seeing the likeness to the extent that one of my sons called and said, uh, Dad, uh, are you the Pope? Um, you so I, I, I was on, I got a good start with the, uh, the, the facial likeness, but, um, yeah, I did, I did what you said. I mean, lots of contemporary actors do. Um, you look, you go to YouTube and you look at images of uh, of the man, the way he walks, the way he, he talks, which is very important to me, uh, even though he, he spoke uh, with a, a Spanish accent. Um, the sort of the cadences and the, the calmness and the gentleness with which he can say the most powerful things. Um, and there was the, the greatest help to me as an actor, I think, was uh, because when uh, you're playing these people who are ultimately quite powerful, um, you don't want to start with, that's not where you start. What you look for it, uh, the that person's flaws and their weaknesses and you that, that dr have driven them to become that person. And there's particular footage that I looked at when he was uh, be, when he was uh, still Cardinal Archbishop in uh, in Buenos Aires, and he was seen then and is still seen as a very divisive character because of his possible collaboration with the junta, and uh, there's a, a film of him being interrogated by his peers, by fellow cardinals, uh, about this situation, and he looks very grim and very angry that he's sitting there. And he's, bless you, bless you, ha <laughs> ha, sorry. <laughs> you see? <laughs> and, um, it comes naturally. So uh, it's very important because he, you see him impatient and angry and grim. And one of the people who uh, helped me enormously and helped the film was a Jesuit priest in Buenos Aires who was advising us about the ritual of the church and everything else and about how to say mass and whether the chalices were in the right place and all that stuff. But I, I got to speak with him about Bergoglio and ask him about the man, and he said that he worked under him and he didn't like him. And lots of his uh, fellow priests didn't like him because of this, uh, this, this period in his life and the, and the colonels. Um, and he said that he was a very authoritarian figure, very strict. And when he was uh, created Pope and he was on the balcony and they were watching in Buenos Aires on television, they said, we, we didn't recognize him hmm. because he was smiling. Hmm. And uh, he said, we knew him in Buenos Aires as the man who never smiled. And that's really, you know, really interesting, a, a, a character note and uh, it, it it shows that the journey that he's been on. When you say building a character, it, he's, he, he's built the character. Right. And you, f you follow it, you follow those stages. Um, and it is that th there's some drive. And when you see him now, uh, and, and post uh, being made the Pope, he's this kind of liberated figure, I think. It was, uh, it's interesting to note that he's never been back to Argentina. He's been to other Latin American countries. But what's holding him back from going back to Argentina? I don't know. But maybe they'll send me instead. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. Thank, Thank you. you.